Paul, thanks very much. I appreciate you letting me come by today. Uh, I enjoyed skimming through your next issue and uh, give you an advertisement here. My former chief of staff, John Bridgeland, is one of your authors. And uh, one of the reasons I'm here, of course, John chose today to be in Texas rather than to join us. Uh, I have to give him a hard time about that, but uh, he does keep me up with what you're doing. And the index is great. Thank you for doing this again. Now, it's not terrific news. Uh, you know, 2% or so improvement, I think. Uh, Ohio's still number 30, which I'm discouraged by. But uh, it's good to have some metrics. And, you know, this measures outcomes. And what we want to talk about today, I think, is more sort of inputs. How do you change some of these outcomes? Uh, it's nice that you agreed to have this meeting in Washington today because most people try to stay as far away from Washington these days as possible. Uh, the approval rating now for Congress, I think, covers around 10%. And I gave a talk back home recently when my wife Jane was sitting in the front row, and I said, that's, you know, family members and staff. Uh, and she said, don't count on me. So I don't know where that 10% is. I can't seem to find them. But, um, you know, we, we aren't doing the people's business, and, and that's part of the problem, I think, is that we're not providing the certainty and predictability that the economy needs right now with just doing the basic functions of, of governing, including appropriations bills and prioritizing spending and passing some of these reforms that were just mentioned by, by Paul. So we've got lots of uh, opportunity, to use your word, here, because we're, we're simply not hitting the ball. We're not getting the work done. Um, and, and Paul mentioned some of the things that, that uh, are talked about in, in the latest uh, edition of the uh, Washington Monthly, but also uh, suggested in the, in the index. And, and I think those are all true. Uh, I think... John Kennedy used to say, a rising tide lifts all ships. And the first thing we need to do is get economic growth back. I mean, if you don't have economic growth, it's difficult to solve so many of the problems that are identified. And we have differences of opinion, obviously, about that. And here in Washington today, those differences of opinion result in a lot of uh, fury and uh, partisanship and very little action. But part of what I think we need to do as a, as a country is decide whether we're going to take on reforming some of the basic institutions of our economy. And if we don't do that, uh, then I, I fear America continues to slip further behind. You mentioned some of the Scandinavian countries that now have, based on the Opportunity Index, more opportunities than we do. And I'll just tick off a few of those because there, there are things that I think can be bipartisan. These are not things that should be, in my view, uh, terribly difficult for us to do. One is to relook at how we raise our revenue because our tax code is antiquated, it's inefficient. Uh, everyone believes that, by the way, right, left, or center. People have different views as to how to address it. But let's get busy on it. Uh, one of the things I hope comes out of the budget conference, I'm a member of it, is that we put in place a series of instructions to facilitate and expedite tax reform. And it wouldn't prejudge how it comes out. Democrats, uh, for the most part, would like to increase revenues under the tax code. Republicans would not. But all of us should agree that the current way we raise our income is so inefficient. It doesn't allocate resources, as the economists would say, appropriately. And we haven't done it for so long, 86, with regard to the individual code, really the 1960s, with regard to the, the corporate code and the international provisions, which are totally outdated now. 1986 was the last time that we changed the rate on the business side. And I know corporate tax reform puts people to sleep. Please do not fall asleep while I talk about this. But it affects every one of us. And it is mostly affecting workers. So the Congressional Budget Office does an analysis and says, if you modernize the code, broadening the base, lowering the rate, uh, the president himself supports a tax revenue approach to this uh, that is revenue neutral. In other words, he's not saying we need to raise more taxes, under, understanding that we're not competitive globally right now. But CBO says if we do that, 70% of the benefit goes to workers in terms of not higher wages, higher benefits. This is obvious. I mean, we, we've got to figure out a way to make our companies more competitive. By the way, the last time we did this uh, was when Ronald Reagan was president. And uh, someone reminded me recently, we still use the telegraph, you know, for messages sometimes. And... Uh, since that time, every single one of our competitors, all of them, including the Scandinavian countries that we've talked about, have reformed their tax code. All of them. Uh, and by the way, they've all lowered their rates, too. So now we have the highest tax rate in the world on the business side. That's not a number one you want on your index. Um, what you want to 
do is create opportunity. So that's an example where we have a president saying he wants to do it. Most of us in Congress think we're saying we want to do it, Republican and Democrat alike. Uh, it seems to me there's more and more consensus around how to do it. Let's get busy. Regulations. Another area where there seems to be a consensus that we don't regulate very smartly. And with the independent agencies, which do more and more regulating, for instance, there's not even the requirement in most cases to go through the cost-benefit analysis that is required for the executive branch agencies. But even on the executive branch agencies, lack of transparency and lack of adherence to smart cost-benefit analysis and using the least burdensome alternative, that alone would give the economy a huge shot in the arm. Uh, just as there's legislation on tax reform, and in fact, we have a proposal on tax reform, by the way, that's been scored by the Joint Tax Committee, revenue neutral, 25% rate, competitive international system. But on regulations, there are several bills. I, I have three bills that are bipartisan. One on dealing with the difficulty of getting a permit in America. Sometimes for an energy project, it takes 35 different federal permits, and sometimes they're uh, not done at the same time, so not in, in, in sequence. Uh, and making it, uh, as I found with American Municipal Power in, in Ohio, trying to put a little hydro plant on the Ohio River, nearly impossible to get investors. But Mark Warner and I also have a provision with regard to the independent agencies. Uh, Mark Pryor and I have a proposal called the Regulatory Accountability Act I'd ask you to look at, that I think is a common sense bipartisan approach to deal with regulations. Healthcare costs, obviously healthcare is the issue today, and we can complain about uh, lots of things with regard to the implementation of Obamacare because it's been not just a glitch but a disaster. But the underlying issue is cost. You know, we, we spend about twice as much as these other countries that you mentioned on health care, and yet our results are, are not twice as good. In fact, in some cases, worse. So these are issues that weren't addressed uh, in the Affordable Care Act and now must be addressed if we're to again have a competitive economy. So. I just think there's so many opportunities. Trade is one, since Paul mentioned I was a former trade representative, a huge opportunity for us. We haven't had a, the ability to open up new markets for our workers and our farmers and our service providers for years now because we don't have this basic trade promotion authority legislation in place. It's always been bipartisan. We've always managed to get it done. This is the first president since FDR not to ask for it until earlier this year when he did, and we ought to give it to him. Um, because we haven't negotiated any bilateral agreements in over five years now, probably more like six or seven years. And we're losing out because other countries are doing that, and they are providing more opportunity for their citizens. Over 100 trade agreements being negotiated, we aren't a party to any of them that are bilateral. We do have some multilateral ones going on, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which I support, uh, but it won't pass in the United States Senate without trade promotion authority. This is the ability to have an up or down vote on trade policy, which you need to have in our country the way our system works. The executive cannot commit to a trade agreement because Congress can then amend it, and nickel and dime it, <laughs> to death sometimes, and that's why other parties won't come to the table to finally negotiate unless we have trade promotion authority in place. And again, every president, Republican, Democrat alike, has wanted it, asked for it, and had it in place to be able to promote our agenda, which expands opportunity because we trade well below our weight in America. In other words, our exports as a percent of our GDP is puts us somewhere between Tonga and Ethiopia, I think. We could do a lot more in terms of expanding markets. So there are so many opportunities. I mentioned taxes, regulations, healthcare, and trade. Um, another one, obviously, is, is education. And here, again, we continue to fall behind, not just in the STEM disciplines, but overall you have 50% of high school graduates, of course, getting out now, not having a job that can match their degree, and you mentioned the number of young people living at home. Um, so part of it is education, part of it is maybe not getting the right education and not getting the skills that are needed to fill the jobs in this country. We do have a weak recovery. By any measure, I believe, GDP or unemployment, it's the weakest economic recovery we've had on record. Uh, you mentioned we're still two million jobs down since the beginning of the recession. At this time, after the 1982 recession, which was a deeper recession in terms of unemployment, we were up about 7 million jobs, maybe 8 million jobs now. So think of that difference, 7 or 8 million jobs up in the 80s, and at this same time period, after this last recession, we're down 2 million jobs. It's not that there aren't opportunities out there for jobs. In fact, in my state of Ohio, there are about 100,000 jobs being advertised. 
So you think about that. With this historically weak economic recovery, high unemployment, and the real unemployment, I look at the U6 numbers, it's probably closer to 11% than 7%. Uh, there's a disconnect. 400,000 people are out of work in Ohio, and yet there are 100,000 jobs being advertised. So I think this is an opportunity that this group can focus on in a very practical way. It's not just this notion of let's grow the economy and it'll rise all ships, as Jack Kennedy said. It is here's a specific example of where our education system is failing us. And it's not just the K through 12 system or pre-K through 12. It's really the retraining system because so many of these jobs that are being advertised are jobs that require skills that are not being taught and have to be retaught. And so the proposal that Senator Bennett and I have put out, which all mentioned, uh, is called the Career Act. And it addresses this problem at least in one way, which is to say that the federal government is already very involved in this, uh, unlike K through 12, frankly where the federal government is not heavily involved. The federal government is very involved in worker retraining. We spend approximately $15 billion a year for <coughs> the federal coffers, your tax dollars, for federal worker retraining. And yet the evidence is it's not working very well. The skills gap is very real. When I talk to employers in Ohio, I've been to over 140 factories in the last three years in Ohio. I love going to the tours because you actually can talk to the people who are making the decision about who they're going to hire and why they're hiring or not. And they do talk about health care costs and they do talk about energy costs. Another great opportunity, by the way, we had another hour to talk about energy, including energy efficiency. Uh, they talk about trade if they're an international business. They certainly talk about tax, the tax code and they certainly talk about regulations. But one thing they talk about is we can't find workers that have the skills that we need and we can't afford to, to train them up ourselves. And so this is a great opportunity. The $15 billion gets spent through about 46 different federal programs spread over six or seven agencies and departments. And yes, the workforce, the workforce Investment Act is the biggest one we have, but there are a lot of programs. The GAO has looked at this, and what GAO says is that there is overlap. It doesn't surprise you probably. 42 programs or 46 programs spread over all these agencies and departments. Sometimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And they indicate that but for a handful of programs, there's overlap in almost all of them. They also say that they aren't being tested. And Mark showed me in this uh, Washington Monthly, there's a little discussion of how do you get some of these programs to work better and not just work or retrain, but in general, this notion of having performance measures in place. Um, you'll see it on page 55 of your Washington Monthly. <laughs> Uh, and this is, what, this is what Mark Edwards says, um, which I just read. Historically, the federal government has supported programs regardless of whether they actually achieve results. Well, guess what? GAO has looked at our worker retraining programs and found that of these 40-odd programs, only four or five have any outcome measures. So we don't know if they're working, honestly. We, we know given the results, again, given the fact that you've got the skills gap that's not being filled, something's not working. But they're not even being tested. So he says, paper performance initiatives included uh, in the reauthorization of the Workforce Investment Act are a good idea, blah, blah, blah. That came out of, in part, the Career Act, I think, as it picked up our provisions there. He talks about one bipartisan example is the Career Act uh, introduced by Portman and Bennett, who you'll talk, you'll hear from in a moment, which would implement a paper performance model for job training programs. This is the most controversial part of our proposal. We'd like to consolidate, obviously, some of these programs. We'd like to put in place a better connection between the employer and the retraining programs. We would like to involve community colleges more. We have a lot of positive things in here. And by the way, you all have endorsed it, as have a lot of the groups around the country that are focused on how do you make this connection between employers and what they actually need and want. So you're not training people up for something that it isn't available in the, in the region. There's a need for reform here. But I think maybe the most significant thing is to put in place some performance measures. This shouldn't be rocket science. And if we're gonna compete with these countries around the world, and Paul mentioned some developed countries, the emerging economies are doing obviously the same thing. They are focused on the STEM disciplines. They are focused on having a more efficient tax, regulatory, healthcare, energy, trade system in their country to be able to compete globally. But they're also putting in pay for performance. <laughs> they're looking at America and saying, that was our model, and wondering where America is going. It's almost as if we're looking to 
by the inaction, the inertia around this place, and the inability to take on these reforms that are needed, uh, we're sort of thrown in the towel. Whereas these countries that at one time were viewed as bigger government, more regulations, what's the word you use? Sclerotic? Sclerotic? These seem to be the more dynamic economies that are able to react more quickly to the ever-changing global economy and to be able to create more opportunity for their citizens. So I thank you for letting me come today. I hope you guys will look at the Career Act, look at the Regulatory Accountability Act, look at this tax issue where we have a terrific opportunity to give the economy a shot in the arm. All these things will help. Um, the final thing I'm going to say, and I know this gets into a, a tender area, difficult area, but if you really want to get an opportunity in America, it, you've also got to go in our poor rural areas and inner cities and figure out what is happening with our families. I spent uh, the week in Ohio two weeks ago because we had a uh, work period necessitated by us being here during our normal work period during the shutdown. We were all exhausted after uh, passing one bill. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I won't, I won't be cynical about it. It's good to be home. I love being home. But I spent my time in inner city Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati working on legislation that I have called the Second Chance Act, which I authored in the House. It's now law, but we need to reauthorize it. And I'm doing it with Senator Leahy, who's a Democrat. It's bipartisan. The notion is to take prisoners getting out of the system and get them into job training and mental health and, and drug treatment, find housing for them so they don't get back in the system because the rates of recidivism are unacceptably high and frighteningly high. You know, like most people get out of prison, get back in prison within two or three years. And uh, we, we have to deal with this issue because as I was talking to these social service agents, providers, and talking about the Second Chance Act, and a lot of these groups that helped us put together the original bill and are working on the reauthorization, and met with some of these ex-offenders who are now you know, trying to straighten out their lives and, and find ways to reunite with their families and come back together, almost all of them come from single-parent families. Almost all of them dropped out of school. Almost all of them, you know, didn't have the advantages in life that most people in this room and, and, and that I have by having a loving family. And, uh, I, you know, I also go to work in, in substance abuse. I started this uh, coalition in our hometown of Cincinnati. I was there this past week uh, on prevention and edu education and treatment in, in terms of drug abuse. And same thing. I mean, if we're going to get at some of these issues, I think everything I talked about today is incredibly important. It's sort of more my job, the legislative issues, the reforms we've talked about, certainly the Education Career Act and so on. But there is an underlying issue here that I think we too often choose to avoid. And I don't have all the statistics at the top of my head on the number of kids who are being raised in the inner city or in the poor rural areas or in single parent homes, but it's well over half. And that According to all the data that I've seen, whether it's their educational success or their workforce success or their mobility ability to be mobile because they have the skills, uh, they start off with a, with a big handicap in life. So these are obviously difficult issues. There's no easy answer. But if we don't get focused on that issue as well as all these other important policy issues, I think we are not going to be able uh, to achieve what John Kennedy talked about. The rising tide won't lift all ships because some ships will be stuck stuck in the sand. Thank you all.